if you're not failing, if you're not falling short, I would argue you're probably not taking enough risks or you're not swinging big enough. That's Ryan Holiday, best-selling author, thought leader, and media strategist. You have to take action. Perception tees up action because by focusing on what's in your control, by focusing on what's positive, by focusing on your response, you now have a direction to go in. But if you don't go in that direction, all you're doing is playing around in your mind. I'm Michael Mogul, founder and CEO of Crisp Video, the nation's number one law firm growth company. I've built my business through practice, not theory. Crisp started with just $500 to my name and has grown to over eight figures in revenue over the last few years, earning a spot on the Inc. 500 list of the fastest growing private companies in America. Our approach has been to take everything we've learned about generating massive growth within our own organization and help the country's most ambitious and committed law firm owners do the same for theirs. In each episode of this podcast, I sit down with innovative market leaders from the legal industry and beyond to learn from those who thrive in the face of adversity, challenge the status quo, and define what it means to be a true game changer. I sat down with Brian Holiday to discuss how our perception of obstacles and challenges influences our responses to them, how to take discipline and strategic action in the face of adversity, and how persistence with the right feedback loop will help you overcome any barrier that stands in your way. Focusing on someone other than yourself, focusing on something larger than yourself, not only is this a nice distraction, but it builds morale and it's an opportunity that you shouldn't go to waste. That's coming up on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Ryan Holiday is the author of multiple New York Times bestsellers, including Ego is the Enemy and The Daily Stoic. Today, we're unpacking one of his most critically acclaimed books, The Obstacle is the Way, The Timeless Art of Turning Trials into Triumph, which is based on the stoic exercise of framing challenges as opportunities. I wanted to begin our conversation by asking Ryan to define in his words, what is stoicism? We tend to think of philosophy as this sort of abstract theoretical thing. And it can be that, but it's also, I guess, sort of like the law. It's meant to be applied. It's meant to sort of meet the rubber of the road of real life. And it's probably not a coincidence that uh, a big chunk of, if not most of, of the Stoics in ancient Rome were lawyers in, in some capacity or another. But the idea of Stoicism as a philosophy is basically rooted around this idea that we don't control what happens, we control how we respond. And what I love about the Stoics and why I think they remain relevant today is that the Stoics weren't necessarily known for their brilliant writing or their beautiful writing. They were known for what they actually did, like in real life. You know, Marcus Aurelius is, is not just the emperor of Rome. He's the emperor of Rome during the Antonine Plague. So this idea that it, you know, it seems eerily relevant today, it's for a good reason. Like he was going through what we are going through. So I think what struck me about Stoicism was its simplicity, its straightforwardness, and then ultimately that it is a set of solutions to life problem, life's problems, the daily occurrence of obstacles being, you know, the sort of most important part. And so in the book, you really divide it into three parts, right? So perception, action, and will. And you know, I want to start with perception because it seems like the first thing that we need to do when, when we're encountering an obstacle is to really kind of check our perception. But how do you define this? Sure. So the discipline of perception is, is the first discipline because how we see things determines what they are. And, in, and there's probably no one more well suited to this than a lawyer that, you know, the ability to split hairs, to really examine things, to see it from different angles is really important. You know, the, the Stoics would agree with that line from Shakespeare that nothing, neither good nor bad, but thinking makes it so. The story we tell ourselves about things, the way we interpret a thing is really important. I guess the Stoics would say life is objective. It just is. Events just are. And then we decide like, oh, that was bad. That harmed me. That hurt me. Or we decide, oh, this is a great stroke of good luck or, you know, this is exactly what I want to happen. The Stoics kind of try to step back and see things objectively. Epictetus says it's not things that upset us. It's our judgment about things. Right. So even you look at the last year, did you get screwed? Was it horrible? Was it the worst thing that could have happened? Uh, that's one story you could tell yourself about it. The other story you could tell yourself about it is that it was a, a giant forced lifestyle experiment, that it was a test or a challenge, that it was you know an opportunity to do things differently, that it was a time to spend more time with your family. Like You decide what you're going to do with it. Again, what it is, we don't control largely, but we do control 
what we're going to do about it. And that starts with how we decide to see it. And I love in the book, you talk about like recognizing your power, because it really brings the question about of like, how can someone feel empowered and really recognize their power when they can feel that there's so many aspects of this that are outside of their control or you know, aspects in their environment and so on. I remember you tell the story of like of Hurricane Carter, like the boxer. So if, if you could speak to that. Yeah, I mean, he's a boxer. He's wrongly accused. He's sent to prison. Objectively, this is a grave injustice. It shouldn't have happened. But what he decides as an individual in that prison is to use that time productively, to not be broken by it, to not become resentful and bitter because of it, but to fight for his freedom and to never relinquish the one power we always have, which is to decide the meaning that we're going to take from something. And so that's that's really, really essential. And I think some of us are primed to tell different stories at different moments. Like, you know, a hedge fund knows that their job is to make money, whether the market goes up or down. That's what they do. And I think there, there's something about your profession, there's something about my profession that that has a similar amount of adaptability to it. I remember a mentor of mine told me, he said, Ryan, like, you have to remember is that as a writer, the good thing is it's all material. You know, somebody screws you over, you get dumped, you mess up, you know, you lose someone you love. It doesn't matter what it is, it's material you can use. And so the decision to go, hey, this is material, allows me to go through the world a little bit less sensitive to whether things are happening exactly the way that I want them to be, because I know that as heartbreaking as this moment is, as undesirable as this moment is, there's some good use I'll be able to put it to. And I think as a lawyer, as an entrepreneur, it's the same thing. It's like, hey, this is teaching me something. I'm learning because of this. I, I say this lots of times when I'll talk to like an insurance company or something and be like, look, if everything went the way that everyone wanted it to be, you would not be in business. If the law was clear and straightforward and obvious, if running a law firm was easy, none of the people on this call would have a job. And even within that, there wouldn't be much value to be created. There wouldn't be the opportunity to be you know, more successful at it than someone else. So the fact that it's hard, the fact that it's difficult, the Stokes would sort of grant all that and go, yes, but this is also working with me as much as it's working against me. Yeah. You know, and then you later go on and you talk about like steadying your nerves and controlling your emotions. But what's what's the difference between the two? I mean, I think they're definitely related to each other. I saw this during the pandemic. Uh, you know, I had a friend of mine who was sort of in a not great spot, like location wise. And I said, hey, you know, come. I've got a house you can stay in. Come stay in the house in Austin. And they were very worried and very scared. And it was very clear to me that this was impairing their ability to just make a fucking decision. Do you know what I mean? And so often what happens under pressure, under difficulty, under stress, is we kind of lock up, we lose our head, we lose our confidence. While this is understandable, it makes the problem worse, right? Like this person just froze. And I think we see this in business, you know, a competitor moves into your space, there's some new regulation, you hire the wrong person. And instead of being able to look at it and decide and then make a move, you're just stuck. You're looking at the unlimited options, or you're looking at the fact that you have almost no options. You're looking at all the things that could go wrong and you just sort of lock up. And I think part of the sort of nerve and coolness under pressure, Hemingway defined courage as grace under pressure, is the ability to just be like, okay, here's what we're doing. It might not work out. I might be making a mistake, but I'm gonna just do it because what I'm not gonna do is just stick here and freeze. And I know you state that if an emotion can't change the condition or the situation that you're dealing with, it's likely an unhelpful emotion. Yeah, I think people think that stoicism is the absence of emotions, because that's sort of what the, you know, the word means in the English language. I think what the Stoics are really focused on is destructive emotions. Does this emotion make it better or worse? Or does holding on to this emotion longer than I ought to make it better or worse. That's really what we're thinking about. So this is unfair. I've been screwed over. This is not my fault. Why me? I'm never going to recover. They, they may well be true, but are they moving the ball forward in any way? I know you speak a lot about like perceiving and observing and, and, and practicing objectivity, but what are some practical ways for, let's say, business leaders to approach situations more objectively? Well, one of the things I always I find as an exercise is like, what would I tell someone to do in my position? We're very good at telling our friend, like, you got to fire this person or 
you just got to let this client go. You got to admit you were wrong, you know, blah, 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 blah. But then when it comes to us, because we know so much more, we're so much closer to it, we have a lot more trouble with it. So in a way, this is what consultants and advisors and mentors are really good at and really important. You know, you want to be able to see your position with as much distance or objectivity as possible. And sometimes that means just getting out of your own perspective and looking at it from somebody else's perspective. And throughout the past year, the saying has always been control what you can control. And again, I don't believe that that's being delusional because there are things that are outside of our control. But the reality of it is, and I know you speak to this when you talk about like the story of like Tommy John, but what do we control? The critical question for the Stokes is, is this up to me? So like on a book project, I don't spend much time thinking about the bestseller list. I don't even think that much uh, about the sales. I go, I'm going to write the best book it's possible for me to write. I'm going to do all the things that I have evidence move the needle from a marketing perspective. But then I understand that the result is not up to me. So this idea of what's in your control, what's not in your control, it's not just like a sanity thing. It's also like, where are you going to put your effort? And I kind of think about it like every minute that I spend you know, wondering, is the New York Times going to favor my book or not? Is so-and-so going to review my book or not? Is so-and-so going to return my email or not? All of this is time not spent on things I do control. The Stokes call this the dichotomy of control. I see the dichotomy of control as fundamentally a resource allocation issue. If you have 100 energy points, you want to spend 100 of them on areas where they're going to get you know, mileage. And every energy point that you spend wishing things were otherwise, regretting the past, worrying about the future, this is not spent on what's in front of you where you can make a difference. Yeah. I mean, again, it highlights the the power of perspective. I think anytime you, you hear a story, like, like the, the one you tell in the book, like Tommy John, this guy who played, you know, in the majors for 20 something seasons and blew out his arm. Then uh, they had to have like this experimental surgery. They had like a 1% chance of coming back came back, played, you know, over a hundred more games. Then, then his son gets injured. All these different things continued to happen to him and, you know, ended up being, I think, one of the oldest players in the game. Yeah, he makes the Yankees at like 40 or 41. And as he shows up to spring training, he says to the coach, he goes, look, is it a done deal? Like, are you definitely not signing me under no circumstances? And he's, no. He's like, so you're saying, if I am good enough to be on the roster, you'll give me a look. The guy says, yes, I'll give you a look. And that's all he needs to know. Everything else is irrelevant. He says, okay, then I'm now going to spend 100% of my energy trying to prove that I deserve to be on this team. And then if, it, you know, if the ball goes in, the ball goes in. Perspective is a powerful thing. One of the toughest challenges leaders face is reconciling our expectations with reality. I asked Ryan to elaborate on this. We do this thing, uh, particularly with the pandemic, you hear people saying like, when things go back to normal right? Which is a preposterous phrase. First and foremost, because normal is what caused this. Second, the idea that this is not normal is also just uh, historically untrue. I would defy a person to find me a single normal decade in American history. Things like this happen. I mean, this exact thing happened exactly 100 years ago. In 1968, there was not only a flu uh, epidemic, there was also you know, the worst racial uh, riots in American history. History repeats. So this preposterous idea that like, oh, because things are not the way that I want them to be, they're not normal. And in fact, just even this expression normal is implying a certain judgment. I think the Stokes would say like, it is. Is this a great time to be in the legal profession or a bad time to be in the legal profession? It doesn't fucking matter. You're in the legal profession, right? Like unless you're you're leaving, it doesn't really matter. Like you're in it. And so what are you going to do with it? That's the fundamental question. And I think that gets at the core of it. I, you know, I see so many people, again, in my space where authors are like, oh, what about this? Or I'm worried about this in the industry. What do you think? And I, I go, I don't follow that at all because it doesn't change what I'm doing. I committed to writing books. That's my job. I'm going to write books regardless. So every minute that I spend wondering about who's going to acquire Simon & Schuster or what the Amazon algorithm is going to do is time I'm not spending on my actual work. It's also time that I'm not spending you know, with my family. It's time that I'm deliberately spending being miserable or unhappy or worried, which you know serves no purpose to anyone. 
And one could argue in the sense that it's less about being at a disadvantage. You, you could argue this is more of like a leveling of the playing field. You just prioritize different capabilities, right? Like resilience and adaptability and so on. It's less about, I even think, resources now. Yeah, well, there's this great line in Meditations that Marcus writes, again, during the Antonine Plague. He says, it's unfortunate that this happened. He's writing to himself. And then he kind of crosses that out and he goes, no, it's fortunate that this happened. It's fortunate that it happened to me. He says, not everyone would be able to endure this and not everyone would be able to remain unharmed by it. And so that's another really key, I think, empowering way to think about this thing, right? It's like, sure, it could have happened 30 years ago. It could happen 30 years in the future, but it happened to you. And you can say it happened to you for a reason because you should believe that you have what it takes to get through this. And the saying that like that which doesn't kill you makes you stronger or, you know, the extent of our struggles determines the extent of our growth. You mentioned that this is not just a cliche, but an actual fact. Yeah. Yeah. There's actually something called, you know, we talk a lot about post-traumatic stress, which does exist, but there's also such thing as post-traumatic growth, right? There are athletes that come back better for the experience of having been injured. And it may well be as, as it was, you know, we talked about Tommy John, they can be weaker where they got hurt. It's silly to think that, oh, because you got hurt, now your knee is magically stronger. No, but as you get older, as you get more experienced, as you go through what you've gone through, you learn other skills. You learn how to compensate. You learn how to redirect your energy and your efforts. Again, that's what, what you want to think about. It's, it's not that this thing, you can magically find that it's not negative, it's positive. It's that you can find some positive thing to do because of what happened. And I know you also mentioned that it's not so much the event, but really our response to the event. So the worst thing is not actually the event occurring, but losing our head in the event of that, because at least between one of those two, you control one of them. Yeah. I mean, so you look at the events of the last 12 months. I mean, over a half a million Americans have died. That's a horrendous tragedy. Thousands and thousands of businesses have been destroyed. Wealth has been destroyed. There's all sorts of immense socioeconomic and public health consequences for what's happened. And that's a tragedy. And, and I, would, I, would, I, I don't want to be too resigned to it. I think a lot of it could have been avoided with better policy decisions. So, but here we are in March 2021. It's happened. The worst thing we could possibly do is to add insult to injury by not learning from it, by not finding meaning in it, by not growing because of it, and by not putting in place measures and responses that make us collectively and individually less susceptible to an event like this happening in the future. And I don't just mean a pandemic, I just mean like how many people woke up in March 2020 and saw you know, their retirement dip by 20% and have fundamentally made zero changes to their lifestyle or you know my business has a has an e-commerce line and a, some physical products that we make and one of the things we saw was how vulnerable we were from a supply chain and a logistics standpoint we are better than most in that we do all our manufacturing domestically but we made changes and uh, tweaked things so in the future we don't have all our eggs in the same basket. But again, when people go like, I'm just waiting for things to go back to normal, what you're essentially doing is sticking your head in the sand and going, well, I hope that never happens again. Yeah. yeah. And for those that had that strategy, let's say back in March of last year, you, you fast forward to December and they were no better off, right? You know, at the time you think, okay, this will be a month and then three months and then six months and then, you know, who knows how long. But we talked about perception. I want to talk about taking action because ultimately we've talked about how we can change how we think and feel, but it seems that most progress is made not just by, you know, feeling better, but getting better. The mindset is key. Uh, perception is key, but we're not talking about the secret here, or manifestation. Like you have to take action, right? Perception tees up action because by focusing on what's in your control, by focusing on what's positive, by focusing on your response, you now have a direction to go in. But if you don't go in that direction, all you're doing is playing around in your mind. You're not changing anything. So, so yes, for the Stokes, it's about action. And for people who are sort of uh, want to know where we're going, where perception action will, there's this great quote from Marcus Aurelius. He says, objective judgment now at this very moment. Then he says, unselfish action now at this very moment. And then he gets to the third discipline, which we'll get to of willing acceptance. But 
I think it's key too. It's not just like action. So this pandemic hits, there's a problem in your business, whatever. It's not just like, hey, what's good for me, right? It's what are my obligations and responsibilities as a leader, as a head of a family, as a, as a member of a family, as a member of a community, you know, as a member of an industry. We take action, but it's not just action at the expense of other people to the benefit of oneself. And I know we'll talk about a lot of these things, which I think at times seem theoretical because there's always people listening that are like, that's great, but what do I do? And when we talk about taking action, uh, I love that you mentioned at one point that really courage at its most basic level is really just taking action. But I want to delve deeper into that. Where, where does courage come from? Courage is a key stoic virtue. Courage is the, yeah, as we said, it's the ability to take action. You know, courage is not having no fear. Courage is taking action despite that fear. Um, and we talked about sort of locking up. That's what tends to happen. People lock up, they, they get in their own heads. But as the person who's the head of a company, again, the head of a family, a member of a community, what are you going to do about this problem? Because the problem is not going to solve itself. I focus on what am I going to do? And I think a, a key part of this is like, what's the smallest thing I can start with right now? As a writer, you, you don't write a book in a sprint you show up and you you write the first page. What can you do right now today? How can you get a little bit better today? And I think that's true also when you find yourself, you know, in some massive hole. You know, you get screwed over by a partner, your your business goes way down, you have to declare bankruptcy. How do you come back from that? One step at a time. I mean, that it's I wish there was a magical transformative solution, but it's really a one step at a time kind of thing. It, you know, there's a lot of talk about the process. I know you referenced like Nick Saban, and it's really about kind of shifting from a macro view to really more of a micro view of like, what is something that we can do today, this week, and focusing that way. But I'd love for you to elaborate on that, because obviously, huge Nick Saban fan, whether, you know, I, I didn't go to the University of Alabama, but I, I can appreciate what we, he's done over the years. But that's been very successful for him. Yeah, I was lucky enough to, to talk to the team about the book a few years ago. It's not just the micro versus the macro. It's not thinking about outcomes and thinking about the individual actions. Like, you know, Bill Belichick does this too, like do your job. What is your job? Like, again, with a book, my job today, I'm copy editing a book. My job was to show up, sit at the computer and start chipping away at these edits each one individually is a very little consequence, right? And even the copy edits at a whole might make the book only 1% better. But this is a step in the process. I'm going to do it. I'm not going to get distracted by the thousands of other things I have to do. I'm not going to get distracted about all the fun things that lie in the future that that I'd rather be thinking about at the, you know, at the neglect of this thing. It's like, I got to show up, I got to put in the hours, and I have to know that it's the cumulative putting in of the hours that ultimately add up to the outcome, not every single time, but more often than not. That's certainly, you know, you can control your effort, right? And, you know, when it comes to taking action, I know you state that our capacity to try is inexplicably linked to our ability to tolerate failure. Now, does that come back to our perception of failure, like viewing it as an asset, or is that like a pain tolerance? I think it's both. I mean, if you think you're going to be successful every time and then you're not successful, you're going to be devastated. I think about this from like a, a sales perspective. And I guess it's true for baseball, too. You know, baseball is a game of missing pitches, of not connecting with the ball. But they know, hey, if I connect with the ball 25 percent of the time, the greatest to ever do it connected 40 percent of the time for like one season. So when you think about how consistently you actually have to achieve the outcome, it's much less than you think. Again, let's go back to the sales call. It's like, if you know like, hey, I make 10 calls and I get one yes, then you know on you know call number eight that you just have to make one more on average to get where you need to get. And so I, again, I, I think about that. I'm going to have good days and bad days. I'm going to have some employees that work out, some employees that don't. I'm going to have good workouts and bad workouts. But what I want to focus on is that, am I doing the right things today? And do I trust that the process will, again, on average, deliver me the results over a long enough timeline? 
it's funny you mentioned this in the early days of crisp i read this silly book if anyone's heard of it it's like you, you'll never get the story out of your head it's called go for no and i used to keep this list where every month i would go for at least a hundred no's and rejections so i didn't even chase the win uh it was more so like i wouldn't stop until i got no a hundred times and every month and that that was just my goal each month so in a way it's it's, it's just you're viewing it as like action and failure is really two sides of the of the same coin that's totally right. And I would imagine by thinking about the nose, the positive there is that you're not also getting the inflated ego from the yes. You're just focusing on the process. You're almost looking forward to the nose because that's what you're measuring by. You know, yeah, if you got three yeses and that was your goal and so you stopped, you might have left a half dozen yeses on the table that by going for the nose, you know, you made it more likely you'd eventually get to. Again, with, with authors, if you are only focused on books that are going to crush, you'll probably not take enough risks. You know, you might not do that crazy thing that could fail or it could be transformatively successful. So if you're not failing, if you're not falling short, I would argue you're probably not taking enough risks or you're not swinging big enough. Yeah. And... You know, there's reasons and results. It seems like the word of the day for the past year was the word like pivot or adapt, right? And we're talking about evolving and innovation. And and you argue that when the stakes are high, you'd better be willing to bend the rules, to do something, you know, desperate or crazy. And, and that's pragmatism is not so much like realism as, as it is flexibility. And we know so many, you know, so many business owners and even and firm owners that whether it was early on with COVID or even still today, just wouldn't change their approach. And whether that meant evolving with technology, whether it meant serving clients in a different way, but I'd love for you to speak to that. Yeah. And, and when I say, you know, breaking the rules, I'm not talking about like, hey, we're, you know, we're not going to enforce a mask mandate or something. What I'm talking about is here's the way it's always been done. And so you get trapped in this box of, well, now things have changed and it's harder to do that thing. Well, maybe that's an indication that you should try a different way of doing it. You know, it was great. Uh, I, I put out a book in uh, September and it debuted at number one. It did great, but I didn't do any events. 90% of the things that you're supposed to do on a book launch, I was not able to do. And I have another book coming out in the fall of this year, actually almost the exact same date, uh, about courage as it happens. But I'm so, in a way, I'm so glad that the events of September 2020 happened, although I probably didn't sell as quite as many copies as ordinary and you know there were disadvantages to it. But I also, because of this experiment, learned so much of what I was taking for granted as like the playbook was just a complete waste of time. And so going forward, I'm now better for this disruptive, you know, destructive event. And so much of what we talk about is really just what what type of behavior, what type of mindset, what type of perception is, is going to be the most productive for you. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. And there's a part where you talk about just preparing for none of it to work. So if someone's going to prepare for none of it to work, how do they balance that with, with also wanting to apply a significant enough amount of effort to it actually being successful? Well, I, I tried to set it up so it's perception, then you take the action and so, okay, you've thought about it in this creative way. You've applied all your resiliency and determination and creativity to it. Hopefully, most of the time, that's going to be successful. You know, there were people who, you know, maybe they owned a restaurant. And so in March of 2020, they pivoted. They did this. They did this. But it may just be that now, fundamentally, the economics of the industry or the region or the area that they're in, it's just not viable anymore, right? And... What I don't want that person to do is to take that so personally, to so identify with how they've been doing things that they think they need to hold on to it forever, when it may well be that what's called for is a tactical retreat here and a, a new business or a new way of doing things, or just because you've gone down a road pretty far doesn't mean you go down that road forever. What's also important is like, look, life will kick your ass. Like you don't win every time. And so if you are so determined and so persistent that you never have the ability to just accept, okay, this didn't go how I wanted it to go. This didn't work out. You're going to end up enduring something longer than it, you actually should endure it. So when I talk about prepare for nothing to work, that leads into that third discipline of stoicism, which Marcus Realist defines as the willing acceptance of external events or things that are outside of your control. 
And when talking about any any type of adversity, it's always interesting to see like how adversity impacts us, right? So you mentioned it can harden you or it can loosen you up and make you better. But how do you essentially respond to it in the right way to basically get the benefit of that adversity? Yeah, I mean, there's some people who stuff happens, makes them more selfish, more disagreeable, more angry, more insular. And then there's other people who, you know, the events of the last year, let's say, opened them up. It made them a better boss, made them a better spouse. It made them a better friend. It made them a better member of their community, right? So you can sort of look at these things that happen as an unfair thing that happened to you or as an opportunity. The Stoics have this idea of a more fati, a love of fate. Marcus says, you know, we turn a fire, he says, turns whatever happens to it into fuel, into flame and brightness. And I think the ability to say, hey, the events of the last year completely kicked my ass. It destroyed my business. It, it took this person I love for me, whatever that happens to be, and then go, okay, and so now here's what I'm going to do. Here's how I'm not going to let this break me. Here's how I'm going to become better for what has happened. Yeah. And as we get into the latter part of the book, you talk about will. And you mentioned that this is the most difficult of all the disciplines. And I love to just hear not just why, but also how do, how do you define will? Yeah. I mean, this is what we're talking about. The, the will is harder because it's just about putting up with stuff, right? It's just about enduring. It's just about hanging on. And it's about that, you know, really difficult thing of acceptance. I sort of define will as that sort of inner kind of soul power that we have that allows us to, this thing was supposed to take two weeks and here we are 12 months later. How are you doing? You know, willpower is a, is the swing vote there. Yeah. And you talk about this concept of like building your inner citadel. I think you give like a, an example of like Theodore Roosevelt, but what, what do you mean by this? And like, what is, uh, you know, our inner citadel? Well, how do you cultivate, uh, someone said of George Washington that he had kind of a cabinet of fortitude, which is another metaphor of like, hey, look, when shit gets tough, this is where I reach into. This is my reserves that I draw on. So maybe that's physical, like as a person who, who likes endurance sports, you know, it's when I'm 90% of the way through a manuscript and I, I hate it and I want to quit and I'm not sure it's going to work and I've already been on this for a year, I think about, hey, this is like when I'm 23 miles into a run. This is what you feel like when that hill just won't quit and you got to decide, are you going to quit or are you going to get to the top? So what are you drawing on? What are your reserves? What's that sort of real inner strength and character that you have I mean, anyone can be good when things are good, but can you keep going when things are not good? This is what we have to cultivate willpower for. So what is that X factor, right? Because it seems like we don't come out of the womb resilient, right? That, that's something that's almost like a muscle, right? Our mind, our brain is kind of built through consistent you know, endurance, if you will. But you know, for someone that says, Ryan, I hear what you're saying, but when I'm running, I want to stop after mile three and I stop after mile three. So that would be a great opportunity to develop that muscle. Like, hey, I want to quit, but I don't. Can you have that conversation with yourself? Seneca, one of the other Stoics, he talks about how he's like, I pity the person who has never been through something because they don't know what they're capable of. And so I would say, look, you survived one of the most significant, difficult, unpredictable and intimidating natural disasters and public health crises of the last 50 years, 70 years, right? Like you lived through a profound historical moment. And some of us did better than others, but by, if you're hearing my voice, you survived, right? You got through this with some semblance of your, of your act together, you're here. That should give you some real confidence, right? Not everyone was able to do that. And maybe you five years ago would not have been able to do that. But here we are. And so the ability to think about what have I got through in the past? I, I, again, like, okay, let's say you're going through a divorce um, and you're heartbroken. And I'm never going to find anyone again. This is so awful. I, I can't believe they cheated on me. But how do you feel in retrospect? How do you feel about all the other breakups in your life? Right. You know that you got through them and you know that they were formative in you becoming the person that you are now. Now, that doesn't magically make it wonderful that your heart was broken uh, and that you're now alone, but it does give you a sense that you have what it takes 
to get through this. In, in conversations where you talk about persistence and then perseverance and iteration, what's the difference between the two, persistence and perseverance? I was just sort of defining perseverance as like persistence and then some, you know, like, hey, the client, uh, you know, they said they weren't interested, but I followed up a couple of times and I made the sale. That's some run of the mill persistence. But hey, I kept my business together, remote employees, 12 months, our billings went down by 40 percent and, uh, you know, I didn't have child care at home. That's perseverance. You got through that. You're here. And like, you know what you're capable of and you are capable of more than you thought and more than other people thought. In the latter part of the book, I love that you went here because this is kind of like that Adam Grant give and take in the sense that focusing on something bigger than yourself and shifting your goal into something that benefits others more than it benefits yourself. And when you do that, it seems like we have more commitment to the things that we are doing when we make it not about us. Yeah, look, if you as the boss are focused on how hard this is for you, it's going to feel really hard for you. If you as the boss sort of embrace maybe a bit more of that servant leadership model and you decide to go, how can I make this easier for the people who work for me? How can I make this better? How can I make them better? What can I, how can I empower them? What load can I carry for them? Not only, I think, do, are you advancing the business and building a better team, but you're going to have a lot less time to feel sorry for yourself. Asking yourself what you can do for others in times of crisis doesn't just help keep your mind off things you can't control. It also helps you forge stronger relationships, empowers other people, and in short, drives success by helping others win. So it's no coincidence that those of us who step up and help others during trying times are the ones who often experience the highest levels of success. There's a moment in the Antonine Plague where, where Marcus Aurelius goes through the palace and for two months, he sells off the imperial furnishings and jewels, even his wife's clothes. Uh, he sells them off to raise money to pay off, you know, sort of Rome's debts. And so, I, again, I think focusing on someone other than yourself, focusing on something larger than yourself, not only is this, I think, a nice distraction, but it builds morale and it, it's an opportunity that you shouldn't go to waste. I mean, how many other companies, you know, things started to look bleak? Let's compare two hypotheticals. There's the company, things are starting to, to look bleak. So the CEO announces everyone's taking a 20% pay cut. You know, we're laying off this many people. You know, you can no longer expense the following things. Okay. And then the other firm who announces that the CEO and the president are temporarily not going to draw a salary, that we don't want people to come into the office. We want people to stay home and be safe. What tools or software or things do you need to be successful? What adjustments do we need to make? So on and so forth. Not only uh, are, are those, is that, I think, morally the correct thing to do, but now once we do come out of this in some way, which company is going to have undying loyalty and uh, you know, a close knit team and which company is going to have a bunch of people looking for new jobs as soon as they can find a way to get out of here. Yeah. And we said this so many times last year in the sense that like, how do you want to be remembered when this is over? When we do come out of it, like, how do you want to be remembered? Because I think that during that time, whether it was team members, people in your community, judges, other lawyers and other law firms, I think everyone was seeing how people were responding. Right. And then the ones that were shutting down offices, laying off team members, basically going into, you know, uh, hiding out and going into you know cave mode. I think we'll remember that when the floodgates open. I think that's right. And, and as this thing went on longer and longer, how many opportunities did they miss because they weren't in a position to take advantage of them. So it seems like at the end of the day, there's always going to be more obstacles, whatever this year holds and the future years and so on. So what are some of the best ways you recommend people prepare themselves for future obstacles? So I talk in the book about James Stockdale, who was in a prison camp in, in Vietnam. He shot down the highest ranking uh, American taken prisoner. And uh, Jim Collins talks about this in Good to Great, but it's sort of a famous story from Stockdale. Stockdale is asked, you know, who really has the most trouble in the camp? And he says, oh, that's easy. The optimists. He says, the people who said, this will be over by Christmas. We'll be out of here in two weeks. The war is about to end. Those people got their heart broken and their hopes dashed over and over and over and over again. 
Victor Frankl talks about this in uh, in Man's Search for Meaning as well. He talks about a prisoner who was convinced, like on April 4th, 1943, they would all be freed. And uh, quite hauntingly, that guy dies on April 4th. Um, he had just enough hope to get to that point. And then something that's outside of his control, you know, doesn't happen. And now they can't survive. So Stockdale says the optimists are crushed. So he says the key is unflinching acceptance of the situation at hand. No sugarcoating, no fantasy, no magical thinking. It is what it is. It's going to last a long time. It's not up to me. But he says, at the same time, he said, I knew that if I did survive, I would turn this into an event that in retrospect, I would never try to change, that I would never give up. And so that's, to me, that's the core of stoicism. It's not, oh, everything's awesome. Everything's great. I'm going to get through everything. It's like, no, shit is real. Shit is raw. Shit is hard. But if I'm lucky enough to make it through, if I can hang on, I'm going to try my best to hang on. If I do get through, I'm going to have learned a lot about myself, about my business, about my life, about the world. And I'm not going to waste the fact that I did survive, the fact that I did experience these lessons, and I'm going to be profoundly better for what has happened. And Ryan, let's say someone's listening and they're bought in, right? In terms of their perception towards obstacles, their level of resilience. But what are some ways to get the rest of the organization to, to carry this type of mindset? They have, you know, or even other people around them, let's say whether it's team members or people in their family, spouses, and so on. Like how, how do they help them find opportunities and obstacles? Well, I have, a, I have a print here on my wall. It's got a quote from Marcus Aurelius. He says, waste no more time arguing what a good man should be, be one. Epictetus, uh, who's sort of the philosophical inspiration of Marcus Aurelius, says, don't talk about your philosophy, embody it. You want your team to catch on? It's got to be contagious and it's got to start with you. You've got to model this stuff. And if you don't, it's silly to think that they're going to pick it up because if you can't do it, uh, why would they do it? Yeah. I love that answer. It's funny. We, we had uh, Jocko Willick. We spoke with him last year and somebody asked the same question. They were like, well, I'm taking extreme ownership, but how do I get everyone else in my organization to take extreme ownership? And one, it's contagious. But two, when you have enough people operating with a, a certain type of mindset or behavior, it actually becomes uncomfortable to behave the opposite. When to even ask that question, right? Like, why aren't other people taking ownership? That's you not taking ownership, right? So I, I see this, uh, I wrote this book called Ego is the Enemy, and I see this all the time. People go, I love the book. What can I do about my boss's ego? They never go, you know, I think I have an ego. What should I do? We always think about how can we change other people, and we're almost always leaving opportunities to improve ourselves on the table in the process. Yeah. And uh, Tony Robbins says something along the lines of like, if you want to put an end to any sort of like stress or anxiety, or, you know, you kind of shift the mindset towards gratitude. So I wanted to ask you, like, how can gratitude to difficult times help to foster resilience? Well, that's this, uh, this idea of amor fati. I, I keep a coin that says amor fati in my pocket. It's the idea of like, hey, it's not unfortunate that this happened, as Marcus really says. It's I'm lucky it happened to me and I'm going to use this. You know, you're you're lucky to be alive. You're lucky to be in the position you're in. You know, you're lucky that you're better off than 99.9% .9 of people going through the exact same thing. And so if you think about this as something that was chosen for you, you didn't have control over it. Something has control over it. This is the card you were dealt. Okay, be grateful for it. Go, this is what I get to do today. And Ryan, just through all of your learnings, all the books you've written, I am, I am curious, like, are there any particular habits that you practice, whether it's on a daily basis, weekly basis that help to keep you on track? Yeah, I have a couple. To me, it's all about the morning, right? Wake up early. Don't touch your phone first thing. Uh, start the day with some intentional activity, whatever that is. This morning, I took my kids for a three mile walk outside. I spent some time with the journal. And then I did my like important creative task early in the morning. So, you know, if this goes long or if I get stuck in traffic or I get some emergency phone call or whatever later in the day, cool. I already won the morning. I already got the bulk of what I have to do. And more importantly, I'm in the right headspace at the right time 
for the things I have to be doing. I think so many people just kind of drift through the day acting as if it doesn't matter what order you do things. And then they bring the wrong attitude to the wrong problem or the wrong task. And uh, they're not as good at it as they could be. Yeah, it's all about, I think, really owning the morning. Any, anything else? Any, any other habits? I mean, journaling is the big one. If uh, Journaling to me, what is journaling? Like, sure, it's the writing on the paper. It's, you know, you're using this one or this. What journaling is, is to me, ritualized self-reflection. How often do you step back and look at who you are and what you're doing? And I think even now we keep talking about this. This is 12 months into the pandemic. I'd advise everyone to take a few minutes and sit down as a leader, as a citizen, as a human being, as a spouse, as a community member, and go, how did I do? Did I believe in ridiculous conspiracy theories? Did I, was I part of the solution or part of the problem? Did I keep people safe? Was I smart? Did my energy give out at some point? Where was I great? Where could I improve? And just spend some time like writing down and have this conversation with yourself. And I think the more often you do that, the more you're going to be able to learn and improve and change. And right, for, so for many of the people that, let's say, are just learning about you and, and a lot of the writings that you've done, where, where can listeners learn more about you? Just in some of the things we've talked about today. Seneca says that really the path to wisdom is like just one thing a day, one story, one idea, one quote. So I send out uh, an email called The Daily Stoic. It's dailystoic.com. And uh, it goes out to like 300,000 people all over the world. And it's just sort of one stoic inspired piece of thinking every day. See if it if that can't help you kind of win the morning as we're talking about. So I'll ask you the, the marketing question. How'd you build the, the, the 300,000 person email list? So I had a, I, I started an email list uh, almost 11 years ago where I just recommended books. I just recommended books. So that, that email list grew. So when I decided to do the daily list, I started there. And it, it, so it started with about 10 or 11,000 people, and it's grown by word of mouth to 300,000 people over uh, about four and a half years. So if you make something of value to people, word of mouth is your friend. If you make something that isn't valuable to people, that doesn't do a job for them, you got to spend a lot more time marketing and pushing and hustling than you otherwise would. I love it. And so I don't know if this is public yet. So if you can't answer this, it's okay. But so I hear you, you've been working on the next book or maybe it's finished. When, when can we expect the next book? So I, I just put out, I, I did a, a short sort of fable during the pandemic called The Boy Who Would Be King, uh, which people can get at dailystoic.com slash king. And then I'm working now on my next set of books, the first one, which will come out in September of this year. Love it. Love it. So let's close out with this because CRISP has become synonymous almost with the word game changer. We've got a conference by that name, a book. What what does being a game changer mean to you? Uh, my friend George Raveling says, uh, are you going to choose to be a positive difference maker today? And to me, it's like a game changer is someone who wakes up every day. And I would assume that the implications of the word game changer is using means a positive difference, right? You could change the game for the worse, that's almost easier than, uh, than, than not. So do you wake up every day and move the ball forward? Do you improve the people that are around you? you know, do you do work that you know, makes you better? So to me, it's all about getting a little bit better every day. I wanna give a huge thank you to Ryan Holiday for taking the time to speak with us today. You know, what particularly resonated for me was when Ryan said that it's in our best interest to focus and commit to changing the things that we can control rather than wasting time complaining about the external obstacles outside of our control. And when you take ownership of everything in your world, you're actually empowering yourself to persevere through anything. You've been listening to the Game Changing Attorney Podcast with me, Michael Mogul. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you could share the podcast with at least one other ambitious law firm owner who you believe would benefit. And you know what? Maybe more than one. For more information on our interview with Ryan Holiday, see the show notes for this episode in your podcast app or visit gamechangingattorney.com. And join us next time when we'll be speaking with the best-selling author of The Case for Culture, Eric Farber. Creating the unpoachable person is about creating fans just like your clients. If you have a client that says, you have to go see so-and-so, the personal injury attorney, he changed my family's life by what he did because of that car accident case. It's the same thing with your employees. It's the same damn thing. That's next time on the Game Changing Attorney Podcast. Oh, 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 oh,